So seeing they couldn't perceive, hearing they could not hear, unless they turned their heart back to Jesus. That's how this Bible will be to you until you turn your heart back to Jesus. And this is not a one-time thing. Well, I repented when I was in the third grade. No, this is a lifestyle. Okie dokie. Fantastic. Just need to introduce some friends here that we have in town. I want you to meet them. First, uh, Dave and Lizzie. Y'all want to show off your, uh, yes. your new baby? Wow. Fantastic. Good job, Lizzie. Very good. You did good. Yeah, fantastic. Congratulations. And uh, last night, I think, uh, or this week, past week, uh, Oscar and Maria Jose Vega had their little baby boy. So, so hey, the church is growing. It's fantastic. Yeah. Good. David James, I want to just, if you'll stand up, I want to just introduce you. David is a longtime friend of Robert. They've been known each other for over 40 years. David is a missionary in Nepal. And uh, he ministers to the poorest of the poor. And so has an amazing ministry. He was a college wrestler. Weren't you a wrestler in college? Oh, a University of Tennessee. Well, did they win last night? All right, fantastic. I just thought you might say that. Fantastic. And then right here with Robert is his first cousin, Dave Sherman. So, Dave, I've heard all about you. Nice to finally get to meet you. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Long time. Long time. Fantastic. You know, October is the time of the year where we really talk about vision. We talk about vision. And as we walk parallel and beside the church and the vision that God has given us, my hope is that we'll learn some things about our individual lives, our individual vision that God's given us for our lives uh, individually. But today, I really want to talk again, really more about the prophetic vision that God has given us as a church. And I want to talk a little bit about how to move it from being a vision to reality, from being a vision to reality. And so I want to begin, really, just by just sharing again with you, I don't think I can say it enough, really, is the vision that God has given us as a church. We are building a community for God-seekers. And that's what we want, from the least to the greatest. We, we want to have an open door, an open heart, an open life to God, other God-seekers. And so we're building a community for God-seekers. We have one church with multiple campuses. And so in a few minutes when I finish here, I'll get in my car and I'll drive over to the other one, which is 1.1 mile away, and, uh, and I will share with them the message that I'm giving you. And so as we do that, we open up the opportunities for more leaders. We open up the opportunities to reach different neighborhoods, more people, while still maintaining a community of believers. You know, when you walk in the back door, you see people that you know, that you do life with, but you also see people that you've never met before. And so have a community where we have, it's, it's multi-ethnic, multi-racial, it's, uh, and it's multi-generational. So I believe that's what a healthy church looks like. And, uh, and so that's the kind of church that you're a part of. So it's important that you understand that that's what we're working on. Whether we're talking about small groups or world missions or local missions or just about any kind of subject that we bring you, it's really under the, under the cover of the idea that we want to build a healthy community for people who are seeking God. And God seekers can start with those of you who are just now beginning your walk with God all the way over to those of you who've been walking with the Lord like Dave and Robert Sherman all their life. And so, so we're building that kind of community. So that's our vision. That's the prophetic word. That's what God's spoken into us and what he's doing with us. So that impacts our mission. What is our mission? To make disciples, to train leaders, and to impact the world. And so whether you're a, a newborn, like David and Liz, Lizzie have, or, or you're an old guy like me, we want to uh, be involved in, in being discipled and making disciples. And as a result, training leaders. You begin by leading yourself, and then it grows from there. 
and then we want to make an impact in the world. Wherever God takes you, whatever part of the world he takes you to, wherever place in Dallas he takes you to, is that you know how to live your life in front of God, in front of them as a disciple of Jesus. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, where there is no understanding of the word, watch this, it says, the people do whatever they want to. And, uh, you know, in the, my new King James, it says, where people, watch this, uh, they cast off restraint. And so they do whatever is right in their own eyes. And so vision keeps us all together. Vision's like, uh, vision's like an airplane. I mean, when you go to the airport and you're trying to make your way to the flight number that you're going to, you see people from all over the world walking around you, walking by you, going to all kinds of different places that day, but you're headed to one particular flight. And then when you get into that airplane and they close the door, all of you are in that airplane are unified with the same vision to get where we're going. That's what we want to be here. We want to close the door and say, this is where we're headed. This is where God is taking us. This is what we're doing. And that's what you'll hear on Thursday night. What does the future look like for our church? And this great collaboration that God has between mankind and particularly Trinity Church and himself, what does that look like going forward? And I think you'll be really interested to hear that. And I also, Nancy, I want you just to come and celebrate and have fun for 29 years in a row we have supported global and local missions to the tune of millions of dollars. And so we're serious about the Great Commission. And, uh, and you'll get to hear about that. Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision and make it plain. Make it clear. On tablets that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. So prophetic vision is something that is going to happen in the future something that we're pointed to in the future. And for that reason, you have to have a hope, right? You have to have a hope. And that hope, and then, is an anchor for your faith because faith is the substance of the things that we hope for. And so he says, for this vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. He personifies the vision just like it was a person. And, uh, and he says, this vision that God gives a people, where the individuals are like us, big Trinity Church, where he gives us a vision, he said, that vision begins to take a life of its own. It will speak to people. It will gather the resources that it needs to, to grow. And it will, it will have a life of its own. And so that's why sharing your vision, speaking it out in words is so important because uh, that vision takes on a personality and it takes on a, it takes on a life that gathers the resources, the people, and the, and the places that God intends for us to change. So what did we learn from last week? We learned from Mark 4, 26, that God gives us his vision. He has a vision for the kingdom. Jesus had a vision, the kingdom of God is like. So he gives us his vision. His vision is always aligned with his word. It always requires his provision. You can't do it with your own resources and finances. And it always requires collaboration to accomplish. Isn't that interesting that the God of the universe who spoke the whole world into existence wants to do a collaboration with you and he will not do what it is he plans to do without you. That means that every one of us are important. We're important to the vision. So God gives us the vision. Then we sow the seed. Then God makes the seed sprout, grow, and to mature. And then through faith and patience, we participate in the harvest. It's a pretty simple program, isn't it? I mean, it's not hard to understand the math of that. And so, uh, but I've always wondered, you know, and thought about for years now, been very clear You hear that buzzing? Huh? Huh? It's a fan motor? Oh, okay. Well, good. Maybe, maybe it's... That's great. Praise the Lord. Doing his job. Great. So your seed... And here we are talking about seed, right? So you sow the seed. 
So your seed that you sow is your life. Think about that just for a minute. God gives us his word. His word is a seed. And in contained in that seed is life. Contained in that seed is life. But you have to sacrifice the seed to get the life. You can't plant the seed, let it germinate, and go dig down in there and get the seed back out and do another one. No. Once it goes into the ground, once you invest it, then it's, it, it goes into the ground. Some seed take longer than other seed. That's why you have to have patience, patience. I read in a news article last week that over in Israel, they've been doing some digging, and they found a seed, a viable seed that was over 2,000 years old. And so they're going to plant that seed, see what kind of plant comes out of it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And so when whoever harvested that seed, harvested 2,000 years ago, had no idea that he'd have to have 2,000 years of patience before it would germinate, right? So you and I have to have patience. So for God's vision to be accomplished, he always calls us to a collaboration. We bring the seed, he makes it grow. That make sense? We plant the seed, we bring it, we plant it, he makes it grow, right? So your seed is your life. Now watch this now, because this is the most important jump right here. And your life is your money in foldable form. How can that be? Well, those of you that have a job, (laughs) have a salary, work for a living, have a company, what do you do? You get up every morning or whenever it is you go to work, you get dressed, you put on the appropriate clothes for your day, and you go to your office. And at that office, you sacrifice your time for a whole day's work for a paycheck at the end of the month. So your money then, what that paycheck that you get at the end of the month, represents your life. It's your life in foldable form, okay? So your seed is your life, and your life is your money. How many ever thought about that, that money is like a seed? Money is like a seed. So the Bible says that the seed is the word. That is the living and prophetic vision that God gives. So we sow the seed when we invest into the vision. Make sense? We sow the seed when we invest in the vision. Our investment is the life we sow mixed with faith and patience. So into the soil of faith, the seed goes. What is the seed? It is our life, our life. How do we represent our life? By our money. So we invest our money into the vision that God's have it, and that's like sowing a seed. Your finance become a seed, becomes a seed. So there's life contained in the seed, and your money is your life. When you give God your money, you are investing your life because your money is the seed of your life. And as good stewards, good servants of the Lord, we should always be looking for good soil to plant the word in, to plant our lives in, to plant, to, to plant the seed that God has given us. All right, seed doesn't do you much good unless you sow it, right? You can eat it, but the terrible thing about eating your seed is is that when it gets time to have more seed, you don't have any because you've eaten all your seed. And so seed then, God gives us the harvest for our blessing, but out of that harvest comes seed, seed that we need to use for next time. So I think I can bring, make this a little bit clearer today when I talk about some of the enemies of the harvest. And I'm going to go to the parable of the sower. Now, I've preached this for a long time, talked about it for a long time. I'm going to give you the short version of it today. But this is a parable that really could go, you could do four or five sessions on this one parable. It's pretty amazing. He says, listen, in verse 3 of Mark chapter 4, 
Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. A sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. And some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And then he says, and some seed then fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So the sower is sowing, sowing the seed. And where he's sowing the seed, he's sowing, the first seed falls on the hard path, on the asphalt, on the concrete, on the hard path. And immediately when he sows it, the birds of the air come and steal the seed. Then the second kind of seed is into the gravel. You know this, I mean, you walked into a, a, a country road somewhere where there was a, a blacktop road, and right there next to the blacktop is the gravel. Some of that seed fell in the gravel, and so it had a little moisture, in it, and the seed immediately popped up. And as the seed popped up and the day continued, the heat of the sun caused it to wither. Why? Because it didn't have much of a root. It didn't have much of a root. Third kind of seed that uh, the sower seed fell into the briar patch. It fell into the thorns and the thistles. And it fell into the ground. It germinated. It came forth. But the thorns and the thistles and all the stuff in that wad of plant material that he put the seed in choked it out. And the seed did not bear any fruit. And then finally, some seed fell on good ground. And there in the good ground, it reproduced some 30, some 60, 100 fold. Now, then Jesus says something interesting. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear. Jesus was always using parables. The Bible says that when he got alone, he told his disciples what the parables meant. But those who were outside, they got everything in, in parables. Why? So seeing they couldn't perceive, hearing they could not hear unless they turned their heart back to Jesus. That's how this Bible will be to you until you turn your heart back to Jesus. And this is not a one-time thing. Well, I repented when I was in the third grade. No, this is a lifestyle. Lifestyle, right, David? I mean, it's turning your heart to Jesus every day. It's a consciously and intentionally deciding that you're gonna have Jesus be the Lord of your life. And when you do that, when you do that, then you get to come along with Jesus. And he'll tell you what the parable means. Because we're stewards of the mysteries of God. It's a mystery, he'll tell us about it. Verse 13 says, Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? Guys, you don't get this? How then will you understand all the parables? This is fascinating because he's saying that the understanding of this particular parable controls how you will understand all the other parables in the New Testament. Read, read it again. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? You see, verse 14, the sower sows the word. And these are those are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. They hear and Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Then he goes to the, it goes to the one on the stony ground, on the gravel. He says, these are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it. And they have no root in themselves, so they only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution comes, that's the sun beating down on it. Tribulation or, or persecution comes. He, he says, <clears throat> he says uh, uh, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Verse 18 said, now these are the ones sown among the thorns. He goes to the thorns, shows them this. They, he says, they are the ones who hear the word. Now watch this, verse 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it yields no harvest. 
These are the most wretched of all of our enemies. Because if these guys can get a toehold in your life, these three enemies, if they can get a toehold in your life, they'll keep you from ever living in abundance. They will keep you from for living in fear. They'll keep you in anxiety. Always worrying about where you, how you're going to pay the next bill. Worrying about your retirement. Worrying about your health. Worrying about all those things. Because these three right here, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things get intermingled in your heart with the stuff that you're hearing and the life that you have and make you only see through the lens of fear and loss. Verse 20 says, but these are the ones that are sown on the good ground. He finally goes back over to the good ground again. He said, look at all these that's sown right here on the good ground. They are those who hear the word, those who accept the word, and those who bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. And so Jesus said, this parable that I told is not really an agriculture parable. It really is a parable that you need to understand in order to understand all the different parables. And what is that? What is the understanding of it? It is that we have to prepare the soil of our heart to receive God's word. That's That's the whole message. And if we don't prepare the soil of our heart to receive God's word, then every other parable will go right over your head. Why won't it go right over your head? Because Jesus said, seeing, they won't perceive. Hearing, they won't hear unless they turn their hearts towards Jesus. And so it's the turning of our heart that really controls the whole thing. It's causing our, preparing our heart, the soil of our life, the soil of our heart, preparing it for God's seed, God's vision that he has for your life. And here, I want to make this really, really, really clear. God has a vision for every one of your lives. And so sometimes it's hard to find. I heard somebody say one time, it's like a blind dog in a meat house. He's close to it, but he doesn't know exactly where it is. Yeah. And so that's kind of how my vision has been sometimes. I was like a blind dog in a, in a meat house. I, I, I smell it. I know I'm close, but I don't know exactly where it is. And, and so, so how then do we prepare our hearts for a harvest? How do we do that? Well, I'm going to go back to the seed again. Your seed is your money, because your money is your life in foldable form. So what you do with the seed, your money, will control what, how, and where the blessings of God are in your life. It's gotten so quiet in here. Are y'all okay? Everybody all right so far? It's all right? It's okay for me to just share the word? Is it, is it all right? This is the Bible, Okay. That's what the Bible says. Don't shoot me. I'm, I'm, I'm just a delivery boy, okay? Don't shoot me. Malachi chapter 3. Will a man rob God? How many of you have been robbers in your life? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> robbers and thieves, right? He said, will a man rob God? And then he goes on to say, but yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And then God says, in tithes and offerings. And as a result, you are cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even the whole nation. Now, this doesn't seem viable at some point, right? It just doesn't seem viable. And he said, well, we're not in the New Testament, so let's get out of the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament required a tenth. The New Testament requires everything. So let's get a little practice on the 10th so we can move into the everything. He owns it all, right? And so when you look at the cross, the tithe then goes all the way through the cross because Jesus taught and said that we ought to tithe. We ought to tithe. And so how do we rob God? 
by withholding our tithes and our offerings. And as a result, we don't plant the seed. And with no seed, there's no harvest. And with no harvest, there's nothing to eat. And you're always scraping. You're always scraping. You're always scraping. He says, you're cursed with a curse. Now, let's just think of a curse in terms of it's the opposite of a blessing. So if you were blessed with a blessing, that's the kind of life we want to live, right? But when you rob God, the Bible says, then you live opposite of a blessing. You live cursed with a curse. So he says here, verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Here, here's just some thoughts I had. I've got more after this, but here. We do not pay our tithes. First of all, tithe means a tenth. That's literally what the word means, a tenth. And secondly, that tenth is to be brought into the place where you are pastored, where you're cared for, where you're discipled, where you do life, the place where you hear the word, the place where you... you join the vision, the place where you become a part of a family, a spiritual family. And so we don't then pay our tithes, nor do we give our tithes. The Bible says that we bring them. We bring them. Now, you only pay for something or give something that belongs to you. But the problem here is that tithing is not an act of generosity. Tithing is an act of obedience. Why? Because the tithe belongs to God. The tenth belongs to God because it's holy. The Bible says that, that and shows us that the number 10 is a biblical number of testing. The 10 virgins, as 10, 10 many times you see different the 10 tribes of Israel, the, it always comes with the 10, some kind of test. And so the tithe really is a test. What's the test up to see whether or not we will live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the test. And, and so he says, bring in all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says something he says nowhere else in the entire Bible. Try me in this. He said, try me now. Not tomorrow, not last, next week. Try, try me right now, he says. Says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Then he goes on to say, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you'll be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So there's five things here that we can test God over. He says, first of all, we can test him, see if he opened the windows of heaven for us. That's one. Secondly, to rebuke the devourer on our behalf. Thirdly, uh, that the vine would not fail. Fourthly, that people would call you blessed. And finally, that you would live a delightful life. You'd be a delightful land. That doesn't mean that everything's going to go great for you. It doesn't mean you're going to be rich if you do this. No, that means that you are going to prosper to the extent that you're living under the purposes, the plans, the life, and the fellowship of God. Yeah. You're not out there doing your own thing. Because, see, without a vision, people do what's right in their own mind. And so this brings us all together. So let's talk about the tithe. The tithe orients our lives towards faith. When you give up your tithes, it orients you towards faith. How do I, what do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, when you first, at least Nancy and I were like this, when we first uh, started tithing, we had more bills than we had income. Can somebody say amen to that? Like a stack of bills was that high, and the income was about that high. And so you think, well, I'm just going to wait till the stack of bills goes down a little bit, and then I will tithe. 
Well, the Bible says bring all the tithe into the storehouse. It doesn't say if your income is up here and your bills are down there, then bring it all. No, it does it. It says, no, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So, so it orients me towards faith. And if, in order for me to be able to do that, even though I know it's God's, I know it's his, and I know I need to bring it in the storehouse, for me, then I still have to have faith. But Lord, how will these all, th- all these things get paid? That's where the magic, the magic's a bad word. And somebody say, ah, he was calling magicians. <laughs> no, that's where the amazing things happens with the seed that you plant. It, it, it's like the, you know, the parable where the man sows and scatters the seed, then he goes in and goes to sleep. Wakes up the next morning and the seed has sprouted. The man doesn't know how. It just did it. And that's the kind of collaboration that we have with God. We have to bring the seed. But when we bring the seed, he brings the blessing. He makes it grow. He works on it. He does something. So it orients our life towards faith. Number two, it tells God that we trust him. How many of you know sometimes your actions speak louder than your words? We say, I trust God. Okay, then make sure you're tithing and giving. Yeah. Um, It provides for our church. Yeah, that fan that we have up here, that costs a lot of money. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, it, the tithe was designed by God to support the local church. Can you imagine if everyone in our church tithed the kind of resources that we had, would have to make an impact in this community? It'd be amazing. Absolutely be amazing. Number four, it transforms our money into seed. We've talked all about that. It reminds us that we are not our source. That's a big deal right there. Because some of us, particularly those of us who've, been, who've prospered and have a lot of money, we think that's our source, our job, our income, our investments, our business, whatever. No, no. God is your source. All that could fold up tomorrow. And so it reminds us that we are not our source. It connects our money to a kingdom purpose. The tithe does that. The tithe gives our job eternal significance. That when you get that paycheck at the end of the month, some portion of that 10% at least is going to change the world. Yeah. It gives our job eternal significance. It breaks our self-reliance and greed off our hearts. Number nine, it opens the windows of heaven for God's blessing And number 10, it reminds us that God is first in our life. That's my favorite one. These are the reasons that Nancy and I tie. And number 10 is it reminds us that God is first in our lives. He's first in our lives. So the tithe prepares our heart for a harvest. We tithe, it's like breaking up the fallow ground in our life. It's putting us in position, A, number one, to be used by God. It's building our faith. It's building our trust. It's reminding ourselves that God's first in our life. It's keeping us on an internal perspective. It's making us people of God, reminding us that we're not our source, that our job has eternal significance, that self-reliance has no place in my life. My reliance is upon the Lord. The tithe opens the door for for faith and generosity. And finally, the tithe enables us to generously give over and above. Say, well, Pastor, you got four days to Vision Builders event. It's a big moment for us. And so please come be a part of this. This is our family. This is who we are. It's what we do. The number one reason we're getting together is to celebrate 29 years of God's faithfulness in our church and in our life. It's been amazing. We're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. I mean, like, really celebrate. We got a band. We never had a band before. Listen, 10 years ago, if you would have told me, one of these days you'll have a campus, it'll have a dog park, I would have shot you right there. A dog park? Now... Now we have a celebration with a band. I'm telling you, I'm glad we're not Baptists. We'd be kicked out. (laughs) 
but we're gonna celebrate. And then the second thing is we're gonna hear about what the future looks like for us. And I've got some, um, I mean, up until about a week ago, I didn't have any different report than I had last Vision Builders. But about a week ago, the dam burst. And I got some great news for you. Amazing news for you. Why then am I talking about the tithe? To get you loosened up a little bit. To plant some seeds in good ground that's going to bear great fruit. Right? And you can start today in your bulletin. We don't call it a bulletin, do we? We call it a worship guide. In your worship guide, you don't have one? Anybody on the front row got one? How about anybody on this row? Anybody over there got one? Anybody? You didn't print them this week? Okay, there's a code coming up there. I have no idea where to take you, but got a code. Trinity, yeah, we sure do. We got a, hey, we got a band. We got a fan. And if you dig around there a little bit, you can see where you can get Vision Builder tickets too. So all that is available for you. Look, I don't make any more or any less if you tithe or don't tithe. So this is not some sales job. This is to break up the fallow ground in your life. Man, look, you may be like the church was. I mean, we don't have any new report to report since the last vision builders that we had. And we went 50 weeks like that. I mean, all during the time I think I should call, I should call, I should call, I should call. Lord would let me call. This way, be patient. So through faith and patience, the dam burst. Yeah, it, it burst. And you're going to love it. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It takes, a, takes a vision from being a pipe dream. Gosh, this would be great to actually, this is going to be great. Yeah, yeah it's going to build your faith. Gonna get you excited about what you're part of, the family that you're part of. And so, just want to just tell you again, you, you need to tithe. And then, you, because that tithe will open up your heart to more generosity, more giving. And the old adage, you can't outgive God, is really true. I mean, some of you got the gift of giving in here. You may be stopped up a little bit. That tithe will get you to move and get you trusting God, get you reminded that God's first in your life. It'll, it'll break through. Listen, you may not have had a, you may not have had a good report in over, in over a year, but just be faithful, be steady with your tithe and your giving, and God will burst the dam for you too. He has for the church. If he can do it for the church, he can do it for you. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, look, without a show of hands, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to start tithing. The Bible says, try me this in this now. Now. And see, see if I won't open the windows of heaven for you. Now, look, what I'd like for you to do, would you put the giving thing on there, please? Yeah. I want everybody who's got a cell phone to just... Just click on that. Okay. Does it go the right place, Pastor Matthew? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Just click on that. Now you know how to give online. It's really easy. You can give it in the secrecy of your own electronic media. Yeah, let's all stand together. Come on. I used to loathe preaching on the tithe because I was afraid that everybody was thinking that it's self-serving. But you know what one thing age does for you? Gets you where you don't care what everybody else thinks. It's just the greatest deal. Savannah's awesome. I mean, you're just 65. I don't care what you think. 
I've been doing this for 40 years, and I'm telling you, it has worked in our lives. And if it works for me, it works for you. And the sooner you get on the board, the quicker that you say, well, I don't make but $100 a week. Great, 10 of it belongs to God. Just bring it to Him. Right, yeah, yeah, watch Him work. He'll do amazing things. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this assembly of people. I thank you, Lord, that they are my spiritual family. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that they are people and we are people who know you, who love you, and who put you first in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, give somebody a high five, a hug, handshake. God bless you guys. Fantastic to see you this morning.